for being here and being part of our Wednesday night service. We're glad that you're here, uh, especially if you're visiting with us. We're always glad to have you with us. We have several announcements before we get into our devotional time together. Craig Glenn can... Nine o'clock. Uh, Stephen Hyde next, next week, uh, and our teens are going for their youth uh, each afternoon. Nights of next retreat at October the twenty-seventh. For you, if you'd like to to get more information about that. And we're, we're glad that Greg and, and Kevin have finally come back home from Thailand. So we want to welcome them back. That's all of our announcements at this time. Uh, please join in with our devotional thoughts. Mark your song books, the invitation song of 9-11. 9-11 is a song of encouragement. After you get that, turn to 877. 877. We'll sing this song, then we'll have our prayer and scripture reading and devotional. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beauty, beautiful weather you've given us, Father. We thank you for sparing our lives. We thank you for letting us come and study another portion of their, your word without being affected from the outside world, Heavenly Father. <clears throat> Be with the speaker tonight. Let he have a happy recollection of the things he has prepared. Maybe we'll, let's, let's listen with an open mind and an open heart, Heavenly Father. Maybe he says something that will touch our lives so we can go out and be better Christians, Heavenly Father. We're thankful for Brother Greg and them getting back. Heavenly Father, we thank you that they had a safe trip. Heavenly Father, forgive us where we fail you. All these blessings we ask in Christ's precious name. Amen. Scripture reading tonight will be from Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Thank you, Rob, for reading that for us. In the book, Teaching with Poverty in Mind, What Being Poor Does to Kids' Brains and What Schools Can Do About It, Veteran educator and brain expert Eric Jensen takes an unflinching look at how poverty hurts children, families, and communities across the United States, and demonstrates how schools can improve the academic achievement and life readiness of economically disadvantaged students. Jensen argues that although chronic exposure to poverty can result in detrimental changes to the brain, the brain's very ability to adapt from experience means that poor children can also experience emotional, social, and academic success. A brain that is susceptible to adverse environmental effects is equally susceptible to the positive effects of rich, balanced learning environments and caring relationships that build students' resilience, felt self-esteem, and character. Jensen goes on to say that too often, we talk about change while maintaining a culture of excuses. We can do better. 
Although no magic bullet can offset the grave challenges faced daily by disadvantaged children, this timely resource shines a spotlight on what matters most, providing an inspiring and practical guide for enriching the minds and lives of all your students. The book I just uh, referred to and read some of this from is a book that all the teachers at Hardin County Middle School where I teach have been asked to read this year. Uh, we've been asked to read this mainly because many of our students are considered to be at or near the poverty level, which is evidenced by the fact that roughly 70% of our student body qualifies for free lunches. What the author Eric Jensen is trying to teach us uh, in his book is that the brains of those students who live in or near the poverty level may be affected in negative ways by a various number of factors, uh, many times by their lack of experiences that they are able to attain through life that many of the rest of us might be able to experience. But, all, but while their brains are, are uh, susceptible to these negative influences, they're also susceptible to being influenced in a positive way with the right approach. It is simply up to the teachers to find and use that right approach. So why am I talking about this tonight here with us? There are some teachers in the audience tonight. There are some students in the audience, maybe some school board members, school administrators. But that really doesn't have anything to do with why I'm bringing this topic in front of us tonight. What I'd like to do is I'd like to take the words that I just read and simply insert a few different words and see if we can make application to our lives tonight. Our God and Father in heaven takes an unflinching look at how the lack of Christ and the Bible in our lives hurts children, families, and communities across the United States. And in his book, The Bible, he demonstrates how Christians can improve the spiritual achievement and judgment day readiness of the spiritually poor in our country. In the Bible, God teaches that although chronic exposure to worldly things can result in detrimental changes to the brain, causing the brain to not be able to distinguish between sin and moral uprightness, the brain's ability to adapt from experience and proper teaching means that spiritually poor people can also experience emotional, social, and spiritual success. A brain that is susceptible to sin and its negative effects is equally susceptible to the positive effects that caring Christian relationships can bring about. Too often we as Christians talk about change while we maintain a culture of excuses. We can do better. The Bible is a timeless resource that shines a light on what matters most, providing an inspiring and practical guide for enriching the minds and lives of all the people around us. So you see how I changed just a few words in this narrative about this book, gave it a completely different focus. It shows the importance of our influence on those around us. There are people in this world who are poor spiritually. There are people who are struggling spiritually in this world. People who do not have Bible knowledge in this world. It is up to us to show them a better way of life to show them the Christian life. Rob read to us from Matthew 5, verse 16 while ago. I wanna back up to, chapter, uh, to, to verse 14 and read 14 through 16 all together. This is Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. According to Matthew, we are supposed to let our lives, our Christian lives, shine to those around us. We're not to hide them. We're not to cover it up with things of this world. But we're to let our lives shine. This means that sometimes we must go against the grain, so to speak. Sometimes we cannot allow ourselves to do the things that others are doing simply because it is wrong in the eyes of God. Our lives should be a walking example to those we come in contact with that a Christian, that 
the Christian life, lives his life in accordance to God's laws and not man's desires. There are many of us that sometimes say that we are not good teachers, that we don't know how to teach those that are lost. Maybe we don't feel like we know the Bible well enough. But if we are living a Christian life every day of our lives, we are teaching those around us through our life, through our light, through our example. But I ask tonight, are we letting our light shine to those around us? Are we living a life that is acceptable to God, our Father in heaven? Can those around us see that we have Christ in our lives? Or are we living a life that looks like everyone else around us? A life that is full of earthly influences and sin. When our friends and co-workers use language that's unacceptable to God, do we join in or do we refrain as God would have us to do? What about that work get-together, social get-together at a restaurant where alcohol is served and everyone else is drinking? Do we partake? For the young people now, and I know a lot of them are going out snow down tonight, do you act like everyone else at school? Or do you try to rise above their immaturity and show Christ through your actions? What about your attire in public? Do you look like others when they're wearing indecent clothing? Or are you set apart from the world as God would have us to be? Just like the educational lives of students are in the hands of their teachers, the spiritual lives of the sinners around us are in our hands. If we are not set apart from the world, living a life that is patterned after the examples set forth by Christ, then we are not the light to the world that we need to be. If this is the case, we need to reconsider how we are living our lives. We need to change and quit making excuses. If there's anyone here this evening who needs to respond to the Lord's invitation, whether it be putting on Christ in baptism or asking for prayers for some reason or another, we ask if you will, please come at this time while we stand and sing the invitation song. First verse is 648.
Absolutely. Glad Kevin is back with us this evening. <coughs> I always enjoy the Facebook post because I can see what was going on, even though you're a world away. Glad you're back. Hope you all had a great trip. Are you jet lagged any? It hadn't hit me yet. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, prayer request. Carolyn Skelton. Helton for the H. Helton. Helton. Okay. That's all I end up, yeah. Uh, Debbie Pounds is having surgery tomorrow. And I'd also like to remember Danny Warren. He scheduled you. He don't know when he's got to have surgery. Danny Warren? Danny Warren. Okay. Debbie Pounds. 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 Our daughter in law, Keisha Goff, in South Haven, had an accident. She fell and broke some bones. Keisha Goff fell and broke some bones. Yes, sir. <coughs> Roger Mooney's dad directed funeral home. Roger Mooney is passed away? His dad. 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 So we're clear on Curtis. Curtis Mooney. Curtis Mooney. Passed away. Okay. Reminds me one time, hey, Jonathan Farr from Belmont in an accident his sister was driving and I showed up to school that next day and everyone thought it was me um but anyways it was weird because my sister was about that same age and but anyway I remember that so he is not dead his father passed away was it an accident yes that was an accident okay. <coughs> My name is Kristen Collins. It is terrible. She still has her large intestine with no on the phone. Okay. Is it Tones with last name Kristen? Tones. Tones, let's see. Okay. <coughs> All right, you said large intestine. That's one of my She said not cancer, just dead. Okay. All right, let's go to our God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful to be able to come out this midweek and talk to you and worship you, Heavenly Father, and we so are appreciative of the avenue of prayer. We know that our thoughts and our needs are heard, and we know that as we lift names up to you, Heavenly Father, that you take care of those needs and those requests as best uh, needs to be taken care of, Heavenly Father. We pray that you watch over, over all those that were called tonight. We had various names that were called with various illnesses and afflictions. We pray that you'll bless each one of those, give them strength and comfort and healing, Heavenly Father. Comfort those that have lost loved ones, Lord. Lord, we are so thankful for our many blessings. We're thankful for our church family. We're thankful uh, that our members that were in Thailand were able to come back to us safely, Heavenly Father. We pray that that work will be fruitful for generations to come. We're thankful for the church that it is able here in Boonville to send out uh, missionaries, Heavenly Father, and support missionaries across the fields. And we pray that uh, you will bless those works and those things, Heavenly Father. Lord, we pray that you will be with us, Lord, as we're about to conclude the study of Genesis, Heavenly Father, and pray that we will apply the things. There's so many lessons in this book, and we pray that we will apply those things to our lives and make us better uh, students of your word and better Christians in our day-to-day -day walks. Lord, forgive us of our sins, and it's in our, your great and holy son's name, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Okay, so last week we did chapter 48, and we saw where there was a blessing handed out uh, to Joseph's children. And there were a couple things that were unique about that. One, um, in terms of inheritance, if each of his children were adopted as sons, what does that mean Joseph or Joseph's family got? A smaller portion or a larger portion of the inheritance? A double portion. So rather than getting a twelfth, Joseph's line ended up getting a sixth or a double portion of the inheritance. Something else happened during that blessing that was unique. And what, did, what did Jacob do even though he was blind? He blessed the younger one. He said he's going to be greater and he switched his hands. And we found that throughout this family, they just didn't really follow what the world expected of them, Right? 
you think about it, that goes that way on throughout the entire family line. And the, the humor about that is, is God's plan is going to work out the way God wants to do it. And he doesn't really care what our cultural or social norms are. Um, he's going to take care of his plan, and it's going to work the way he expects it to. And uh, we even saw Joseph try to correct his father, and he's like, no, I know I'm blessing the right one. This is why I'm doing it this way. Uh, so we saw that this, this evening on chapter 49, and I do not know if we will get through this entire chapter. It's not that it's that long as much as it is it's poetic. Um, and I don't do really well with poetry, just to be blunt. And so when I get into this, this imagery type language, it tends to slow me down. Um, also, uh, uh, an, an admittance of guilt, I uh, was kind of late to studying and was laying on the bed studying and then my phone rang and I had to run to town because I got called out for a medical dose and um, I didn't study the second half of this chapter the way I should have. Um, but anyways, Kim was like, well, you can just listen to it on the way there and back. And I was like, <laughs> listening to it is not what I need to do. Um, that's not the research I need to do. So uh, bear with me towards the end of it and if it gets a little rough, then we'll just do it, um, do it a better job of it next week. Uh, but the point of the matter of this chapter is, is that Jacob is about to die. And you know, his name has been changed to Israel, but he goes back and forth in this chapter, comes sometimes calling himself Israel, sometimes calling himself Jacob, sometimes calling himself by both names in the same sentence. Um, but what we see is, is that, as we say in the South, you know, old times are not forgotten. And what I mean by that is, is, man, some mistakes that these guys made a long time ago come up in their blessings and affect their blessings. And I think the message there is, is, there are consequences to actions sometimes that occur much later in life than even when we do them. And oftentimes we in America don't really, we don't like the word consequences anymore. And what I mean by that is, is it's someone else's fault, always. It's never our fault, we never contributed. One of the hardest things that I learned when I first became a manager of people was that, and this was something I had to accept because I was not raised this way, um, was that there is rarely 100% guilt. And I'm going to let that sink in for a second. Because that drove me nuts when I first started managing people. And I'd talk to HR and they'd be like, well, you know, you need to talk to so-and-so about what they said here and what they did. And I'm like, no, this employee said this, they're the only ones that deserve to get in trouble. They're responsible for their own actions. That's the way I was raised right, um, is that it doesn't matter what your brother Doug or what Michelle did to you, you chose to do this, you did this, you're going to pay the consequence. That's the way I was raised, so that's the way I tried to manage people. Can't really do that in the corporate world, unfortunately, because we in America love to share the blame with everyone that actually deserves it. And the point I'm making is, is tonight when we go over these blessings, some of them actually sound more like curses. Um, because there's a consequence to what these guys did some, you know, 20 plus years ago. Uh, so we're just, we go through that, we'll be reminded it's actually a pretty good study of basically these children's lives. You know, we went over them in successive chapters, but then we go backwards. So we're referring back to some other things that we saw. Um, but as we get through here, understand that these are the last words of Jacob. That he has just blessed Manasseh and Ephraim. And he's talked to Jacob, uh, excuse me, Joseph, about the land that his family will inherit in Canaan. And then he moves into this phase where he's doing his last will and testament, so to speak. Understand on the front end, this is prophetic and this is also poetic. Um, so there's some phraseology here that to me is odd. And then I'll tell you that. When I read this, I'll be like, this doesn't make sense to me. Um, but bear with us. We'll get through it. And also... I am not, I am not an astute student of Judaism, okay, just so we're clear. Like, I can't tell you where the tribes settled in various lands. Um, I was studying that when I got called out, because that also, you can see that when you pair up the two, you can start to understand why these things are said. So my apologies on the front end when we get into some of that stuff. I am not going to be your best teacher on this. Find someone else that knows this stuff better. Um... The Hebrews, uh, their, their stuff, I'll be blunt, brutally honest, um, once I get past the book of Exodus, <laughs> I'm just not that good. Because I spent most of my time where? In the New Testament, right? 
and I refer back to the Old Testament for lessons, but I don't study it the way that we always should, and this chapter is more difficult for me. So it may be more difficult for you. Um, but as we get through here, understand that this is prophetic, this is also poetic, and I want you to put yourself in the room, because I think that's very important. And, you know, Papa, so to speak, is dying, and if you've ever been in the room when someone was about to pass away, you know the emotions that are going on in there. You know, I remember the first time I was in the room whenever one of my family members passed away, and I remember those emotions, and that's going on. Everyone knows he's about to pass away. And then the last words that loved one says to you are something you don't forget. Right? They stay with you for a long time. And so I want you to put yourself in that mind that these are the last words that these gentlemen or these sons of Israel are going to hear their father say about them. And it's not always good. Um, but here we go. So we're in the room. He's on his bed. And he starts to lay out these blessings. Or well, that's what it's called. But like I said, some of these aren't really blessings. He says, Then Jacob called his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you what shall happen to you in days to come. In other words, I'm going to tell you the future. Did you catch that? This is what's going to happen to you. Now, we in America don't like, to, don't like the concept of fate, right? We are in charge of our own destinies, and we make our own roads. But in this situation, he says, this is what's going to happen. So just get ready for it. This is how it's going to work. Verse 2, assemble and listen, O sons of Jacob. Listen to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn. You can almost see Reuben sitting up. He's firstborn. He's supposed to get everything, right? Get the majority of the lion's share. Now, he knows that isn't happening because they're not sure whether or not they were in the room with Manasseh and Ephraim, but everyone knows there's a little bit of favoritism. But any time you start out with, you are my firstborn, good words are going to come next, right? So Reuben sits up. He's ready. He says, my might and the first fruits of my strength. Oh, boy. Reuben's getting excited. This sounds great. Preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. Ooh. Oh, Reuben. I mean, a name like Reuben, you're, I'm sorry, I've only known one Reuben in my life, and he was a very imposing individual. Played in the NFL, he was a lineman, gargantuan human being. That's who I think of when I think of Reuben. I don't know why. It's the only Reuben I've ever known. Reuben Mendoza. But anyways, this all sounds really good. Preeminent power and dignity. And then this says, verse 4, this is what you want to hear your dad say, right? Unstable as water. You shall not have preeminence, because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Wait a minute, what? Does anybody remember that part of the story? When he laid with his father's servant wife, is the best way to put it? And we didn't get any type of, in the text at that time, it just says that Israel knew about it or that Jacob knew about it. That's all we get. We don't get a disciplinary action right there. We don't get anything. All we get is that he knew about it. And he says, Reuben, this was all yours. You should have had my might. You should have had my first fruits. You should have had dignity. And you should have been preeminent in power. But you're getting nothing because you defiled me. Now, you're Simeon. You're next. Are you super excited to hear what's about to happen to your lineage? Because you kind of did something that wasn't okay too, right? You're Simeon and Levi. So Reuben sits back and goes, well, I guess I shouldn't have done that. And then he says, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Weapons of violence are their swords. Let my soul come not into their counsel. O oh, my glory, be not joined to their company. For in their anger they killed men, and in their willfulness they hamstrung oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So what was this punishment for? Anybody remember that story? Yes, a group of men defiled their sister and they conned them into being circumcised, which means they were sore, 
And on the third day, when they were the sorest, they ran down there and they killed them all. They couldn't defend themselves. And they killed them all. Now, no one says that defiling her was not, was okay or right. I don't think anyone could read the text and think that they should have just taken this land down, so to speak. But their action, their response was so over the top. Right? You ever known someone that just, you look at them and they're angry. This happens all the time in Little League sports. Their anger is so over the top for what is actually wrong. Now, here's the deal. That was a grave sin. What they'd done to their sister was a big deal. But a whole village didn't deserve to die over it. Right? Maybe the guy that did it, but not everyone in the city. That kind of anger is something that I think forward into the New Testament where it talks about qualifications for elders and deacons. And it talks about they're not just supposed to be quick to wrath. That uncontrollable anger is something that the Bible talks about as something that you as a human being have a problem with, that you have to get that under control. And we see this, and this sounds like a curse, but it's one of those things where what he's actually saying is, I'm going to disperse you throughout the kingdom. Sorry for going scientific on you for a second here. Most people have the concept of electricity, right? Lights are on above our heads. You don't touch one of those wires if it's bare because it will shock you. Those are electrons moving. Electrons are negatively charged, all right? And in the middle of an atom, there's this thing called a proton and a neutron. And most chemistry teachers don't teach this. Well, until I took nuclear physics, I understood this. If I take two positive things and I push them together, what's supposed to happen? They repel. But yet in an atom, all the protons are together, glued together. Have you ever thought about that? That the basic element of life defies the laws of life? So see, God put these things sprinkled inside there called neutrons, and the neutrons spread out the protons. They spread out the magnets. Now, I'm sorry if I went way too advanced right there, but I think most people can get the fact that an atom should explode. Because if you put positive against positive, it should repel. Take two magnets. We do this with third graders, right? It should not stay together. Scientists, believe it or not, call that ability for that to stay together, they named it. They called it nucleon binding energy to make themselves sound really smart. And they even call it the God particle. We don't know why it stays together. But we know neutrons help because they spread out those magnets, if you will. Where I'm going with this, because this is not a science class, is if I take a bunch of angry people and I put them in one spot as a tribe, what are they going to do to themselves? They'll kill each other. Or they're going to start war with another country and all of Israel is going to be destroyed because of it. But what he's actually doing is He's spreading out the anger across the whole land of Jacob. That's actually very smart. Because if you left a whole bunch of angry people together, bad things are going to happen. Right? That's the reason why boxers try to kill each other before they ever get in the ring. You just don't, they don't get along well together. Right? So, what I, did, what I found out was, Levi was given 48 cities, because they were the priests, spread out across the land of Canaan. So that anger was dissipated across the land of Canaan. Simeon was given a portion within the land of Judah. So they were intermingled with the tribe of Judah. Now why is it, in, well, I, don't know, I don't need to get that far ahead, just mental note right there. They were in the, with the tribe of Judah. So just keep that in your mind, that Levi spread all over the, all over the country, top to bottom. Simeon's given a portion within a specific tribe. Let's figure out something about that tribe real quick. Verse 8 says, Judah, your brothers, shall praise you. Judah, your brothers, shall praise you. You know, probably when Judah heard his name after what Reuben got and Simeon and Levi got, Judah's like, oh boy, here it goes. Because, you know, at this point is... If our lives are defined only by the worst thing we ever did, none of us look good on paper. Let's just be frank. 
If the measurement of a man or woman is only based on the bad things they do in life, none of us have a chance. Right? So, right now, that's kind of what it looks like. But then we get to Judah. He says, your brothers are going to praise you, Judah. And so we keep going here. It says, your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, and as a lioness who dares rouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples, binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the, vesture in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth are whiter than milk. Now, if you understood everything I just read, raise your hand. Okay, I'm going to do my best to break this down. Some one thing up is pretty obvious. If you have a scepter in your hand and you're a ruler, what does that mean you are? King. Okay, let's go back to Simeon. Where was Simeon dispersed among? Which group? Levi's were everywhere, but Simeon, I said, was, in, was dispersed within one tribe. Judah. It was dispersed within Judah. So you take an angry group of people and you put them in the tribe of who? The people with the power. See, God is a smart person, or God, I guess I can say person. If you have an unruling class, it's probably best to put them with the people with the power, Right? So he's got them intermingled with the tribe of Judah. He spreads them out across the tribe of Judah. Judah's going to have power. Now, lion club, lioness, etc. What is the difference in a lion and a lioness? Lioness does all the work. I knew someone would say that. And I'm not surprised it was you, just so we're being blunt. Oh, um, no offense. Lionesses are the what in the lion kingdom? They're the hunters. What do the lions do? Lay around and sleep. Lioness catches it, they take the food. Okay, there's got to be something nice about a lion if, the li if, that's a, if, if, if it's described here. They protect. Is that important? Yes. Do you know that the power the lion has in his arm, or his front leg, without the claws, has the power to decapitate a human being? They have that much power in one of their paws if they choose to swing it at your head. That's just their hands, if you will. That's not their jaws. See, the reason the dude sleeps 23 hours a day is to have that kind of power, you have to do a lot of resting. Now, you laugh at that, but I'm telling you, I've learned this this year more than any other time because Tristan, my son, is running cross-country. And... The coach has been talking about needing all these hours of sleep. And Tristan did exactly what the coach said to do. Goes to bed at 7 o'clock on Fridays now. 7 o'clock. Like it's barely dark outside. Then gets up and goes runs. And has gotten better all year long. Meanwhile, his friends staying up to 10 and 11 o'clock are doing the opposite. They ran really hard at the beginning of the season, and they're getting slower as the season goes on. Okay. The lion needs that rest. But the point I'm making is, sorry, that was way too long of a diversion. The point of the matter is, the lion is the protector. So one of the things Judah's going to be responsible for is protecting. Now notice back in the first part of that, it said, your hand will be on your enemy's neck. Now I'll go back to that lion Paul example I just gave you. It can do what to someone's head? And it says, your hand is going to be on your enemy's neck. You're a lion cub. And the lioness does the work. So you're going to have to do the work for Israel, for the kingdom as well. But then there's a couple other things. He says, the ruling scepter will not leave Judah. We're all kings from the tribe of Judah. Not all of them. Who wasn't? Jesus came from the tribe of Jesus, to the tribe of Judah. But what king did not come from Judah? Melchizedek was a priest after, after his own order. What king of Jews, king of the Jews, did not come from Judah? Saul. Who? Saul. Saul. Saul was not, he was from Benjamin. He was not from Judah. 
So the point is here, is it may not have started with Judah, but once it went to Judah on the next king, which was who? It never left. And it never has. Because Christ is a from the tribe of Judah. And he's still the king. Judah was always preserved and protected. He had to be. That tribe had to be. Right? Because the promise comes from the tribe of Judah. Now let's keep going. It says, until tribute comes to him. That was referring to which king then? Once the scepter comes, it will not depart until tribute comes to him. What king is that referring to? No, it's referring to the first king. Sorry, trick question. All right? That's referring to David. All right? Now, next thing. And to him shall the obedience of the peoples. Who's that referring to? Bruce? Which king is that referring Jesus. to? Jesus. Who do we have to obey? Jesus. Jesus. Isn't, isn't poetry fun? Having fun yet? Then you understand why I was a little upset that I got called out this afternoon. All right? Now we get to this next chorus where he goes in through here and he talks about washed garments in wine and vesture and blood of grapes and eyes darker than wine and teeth whiter than milk. This is what we know. During David's kingship, during David's kingship, one thing happened to the, to the, land, of Jew, to the land of Israel, and that was it was a very fruitful time period, specifically in vineyards. I think it's Psalm 72 that actually refer, talks about that. That the vineyards will outpace those that sow seed. Okay? So there's some prophecy here. This is one of the prophecies people in, Ju in Judaism should have gotten that when Jesus came along, this is who this was referring back to. Now it's easier for us. We're further away, right? We can understand that. Eyes darker than wine, teeth whiter than milk. What does that imply? This is not a Jared judgment by my, for what I'm about to say. I'm not judging anyone about what I'm about to say. But in general, if you see someone with crystal white teeth and they're not fake, what do you think of them? Clean, well-to-do, prosperous, etc. Catalog that with someone with teeth that are not that way. Right? This is what we know. Dental health believe it or not, has always been a socioeconomic indicator across all times, across all peoples. You ever know that? It's kind of wild. What's interesting is, is that it's spelled out here. Their teeth are going to be white. They're going to be so prosperous. They're going to be so healthy, so good. What about dark eyes versus light eyes? What? Stronger. Right? You ever known someone with piercing eyes? They don't even have to be brown. Like, you can see people with steel blue eyes, and they will cut through you, like in a good way. I mean, it's a good thing, right? Strong, healthy eyes. So the two things you're going to see first about someone, their eyes and their mouth when they talk to you, both are going to be impressive in the tribe of Judah. That's the point he's making about they're going to look the part of being the king tribe. Okay? Moving on. Zebulun's like, okay, started off rough. Judah sounded pretty good. Let's see what I'm going to get. Zebulun shall dwell at the shore of the sea. Jonathan would be happy to be in the tribe of Zebulun. At the shore of the sea, he shall become a haven for ships, and his brother shall be at Sidon. That would be, if we believe that's referring to the Phoenician Sea. So, this tribe is going to be the tribe that basically is around water. Have you ever been around... Okay, this is, this is good. Because Kevin, I need, your, I need your eyes up here. You ever been around somebody that knows nothing about boats but tries to pretend they do? Is that not the funniest thing on the planet? Okay, it's hilarious, right? You see people doing things all the time, right? We used to rip off people from Memphis. No offense to any people from Memphis listening to this. Because they couldn't back the trailer into the lake, right? So we'd be like, would you like for us to put the boat in the water for you? Here's a $5 tip. Thank you for being ridiculous. Um, we did that all summer. It actually started out because we were trying to be, we were irritated because the dude couldn't park his boat or putting, couldn't back his boat in the water. And we got a tip and we're like, business idea, right? Free toes all around when they ran out of gas because they didn't know how to read their gas meter. Um, 
All sorts of fun things. Let me tell you, you live on the lake in Iuka, these things happen to you. So this is not going to be the case for Zebulun. Zebulun's going to be the tribe that knows their way around water. Now, has the inverse ever happened to you? Do you know nothing about boats and be around someone that everything is nautical? And they say port and starboard and aft and bow, and you're like, stop it! Left and right. Okay? Zebulun's going to know they're going to be those kind of people. Right? That's how they're going to be. They're going to be the ones that are the haven for the ships. That is important in any kingdom. You know what's wild is the battleship in World War II became completely obsolete. The battleship was the flagship of anybody's navy. Did the U.S. Navy go away because the battleship went away? No. Nope. Now we have these awesome things called submarines, cruisers, which are really cool ships, and aircraft carriers. Because whoever rules the seas, whoever rules the seas ultimately will win the fight. It's what killed Germany, it's what ultimately killed Spain when they lost their armada. Go through time, a navy is important. So Judah or Israel needs one of those type of groups of people. That's going to be the Zebulun people. Verse 14. Issachar is a strong donkey. Now, if I'm a Democrat, that may make me happy. But otherwise... I don't really want to be compared to a donkey. They are obnoxiously loud. They are stubborn. They're ugly. No offense if you like donkeys. I don't normally think of a donkey and go, man, that is, that is my, you use the term spirit animal, right? That's not the animal that I identify with. It's not going to be the donkey. Beast of burden, right? Issachar is a strong donkey, crouching between the sheepfolds. He saw that a resting place was good and that the land was pleasant. So he bowed his shoulder to bear, and he became a servant at forced labor. Is that really exactly where you want your family to end up? I don't get this one. We don't know a ton about Issachar, but basically it says that he found a good resting place. What are other scriptures about resting in a negative way? I think there's at least one proverb about a little sleep, a little slumber. Anybody finish that? What? He's a sluggard. What happens to the sluggard? Things go. What happens to him as a person? Go in poverty, fall down, quit working, etc. Notice that it says that in here that this group of people found a good place to rest. There's a direct tie to man does not work, neither shall he eat. Etc. They get into putting in forced labor. Verse 16. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a viper by the path, that bites the horse's heel so that his rider falls backwards. I wait for your salvation, O Lord. This blessing starts out kind of good. A judge. For the most part, judge are respectable people. We think well of judges. But then it turns a little bit, right? A serpent. A serpent does what? This is definitely the tribe my wife would be in. No doubt about it. Everyone loves snakes, right? Hmm. What could that possibly be referring to? He bites the heels of horses that pass his way. All right, so if you don't know Jewish history, you would never get this. Um, basically, the, what I understand from this is this tribe carried out an assault on a group of people, I think they were called Laish, I think, and it was kind of a guerrilla warfare type affair where they struck from behind, kind of unannounced, not really manly, if you will, snake-like. And we, that's, what they, that's what the commentators I read was they believe this was referring to, that Dan is going to be a little bit like his daddy. On the face, he's a judge, proud, strong. He's also got a little bit of deceit, and he'll cut you in the back. You ever know any lawyers like that? Okay? No offense, lawyers, I love you. Um... But think about that from that perspective. 
he runs both sides of this. He's strong, proud, etc. on the front, but he also will bite you in the back. And so then we move on, and this is where my study kind of got stopped. Did you have a hand up? Um, to me, this, this provides some insight into the patriarchal age because, you know, where did Jacob get all this information? Yeah. He's the head of the household, and God spoke through the heads of the household, and it had to be God that's making all yeah. this prophecy because the stuff comes true. Yes. Yeah. Every bit of it did. That's what's, that's what's so amazing about this. All of this came true. And what's also interesting about it is not only did it come true, some of this stuff didn't come true for a couple hundred years. You know what I mean? And um, so that's, what, that's what's wild about this. But yes, definitely, and, and, and to that point, the patriarchal age is dying in this chapter. You know, we're about to enter the mosaical age very soon there after this. Um, so this is the death groan, so to speak, of that age where God spoke directly through the patriarch. It's a great call out. So now we get to this, raiders shall raid Gad, but he shall raid at their heels. Not a lot of info about Gad. What we know is that the strip of land that they lived on was close to the border. And people would come in and raid them, and then they would counterattack and raid them back. That was their life. That's kind of the way it is living on any border of any country that's not exactly good neighbors with you. Right? It goes both directions. And what's interesting about this is, is that's all we know about it. We know where they ended up. We know that this happened routinely. They were raiders. They themselves were. And they also were raided in both directions. Next up is Asher. It says, Asher's food shall be rich, and he shall yield royal delicacies. We know the land that Asher's family basically settled in uh, was one of the most fruitful plains. And so that's where those delicacies come from. Um, various foods that were grown there that weren't grown in other areas of Canaan land, and so their food shall be rich. It's kind of what they were known for. For example, when we went to Boston, I guess that was two years, three years ago now, there is a part of Boston that is known as the Italian section of Boston. Okay? How do you think the Italian in Italian Boston compares to Italian in Mississippi? Somebody's laughing. Why are you laughing? We don't know what that food tastes like. Like Olive Garden's it for us. Right. We're going to cover it in cream and butter, and that's our Italian. That's it. Right? You go to Italian in Boston, one, you realize those restaurants, you cannot take your children to them because they're all white tablecloth. You don't take two boys there. You don't do it. They also don't put prices on their menu, which is always an indicator you can't afford to eat there. But what is interesting is, is that culture, that climate, them being known for hospitality and the food is known. You walk on the street, you get it real quick. We are here for food and possibly the mafia, mostly food, right? That's it when you go down that street. If you've been in the street I'm talking about in Boston, you know what I'm talking about. Never been there? Sorry, poor, terrible analogy, all right? But Asher is like that. They are known for their food. I always love it whenever... I look on a restaurant, I'm researching somewhere to go when I'm traveling with work or whatnot, and it says they sell American food. And I'm like, what is that? I don't really know what American food is. Is that not hilarious? Like, I really don't know other than burgers and hamburg and burgers and fries. That's it. That's the extent of my knowledge. And the Germans started hamburgers. So, anyways, we go through this. They're known for their food. Naphtali is a dough. Let loose that bears beautiful foams. Sorry, I have no idea. All right? I don't know what exactly this is referring to. I don't know if this was the pretty tribe. You know what I mean? I don't know. It's a beautiful image, right? That she's a doe and she produces beautiful foams. That's all we got. Okay, moving on. Anybody else have anything to add to that? Because that's all I know. Yes. New King James says he used these beautiful words. It could be that possibly uh, they were good with poetry. Right. Um, we know that they were in also along those lines. So I think we have at least a few hunters in the room, right? As a general rule, is the deer population, I go with this analogy, is the deer population reflective of the prosperity of the land? In other words, as nutrition of the land increases, does the deer population go up or down? 
Are deer bigger in the delta of Mississippi or in northeast Mississippi? Right, okay? So that was the, one of the things that the commentator I read on this commented on was this may be referring to the fact they settled in Upper Galilee, which is kind of like Naphtali, which is a very fruitful plain, and that because of that, they would be fruitful. Now, I don't know if that's an analogy or not. I'm not a historian. We're just covering this, okay? But now we get to Joseph. Now, Joseph has already gotten one-sixth of the whole inheritance. Don't forget that. Ephraim and Manasseh have already been blessed at this point, and we're going to stop because it's 8 o'clock. We'll get to Joseph. Sorry. We'll get to Joseph next week. Thank you so much.